thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Um, it's a bit like deja vu, because last year uh, we held a torch event on Tolkien uh, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of The Lord of the Rings, and I chaired that, but now I've been asked to speak on him this time. But at the time, I did comment that when the um, Return of the King came out, 61 years ago now, uh, Tolkien did actually sort of surmise that perhaps this was only the beginning of something. So what I'd like to do in, in my talk is talk about the afterlife of uh, Tolkien's books and works uh, in two particular areas. One, in terms of dramatisations of his works, and secondly, in terms of games, which is something which often people snigger at and, and neglect, but is actually extremely important. And at the end, I'm going to try and bring them all together. Um, and like so many things in the digital world, you really have to start in the analogue world first to really understand it. So... Let's start with dramatizations. You're probably all very familiar with some quite recent dramatizations over the past at least 15 years by Peter Jackson, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, but the first attempt to dramatize Tolkien's works uh, actually was by the BBC for radio in the mid-1950s. And radio, in many ways, offered the really only opportunity for people to work with Tolkien's works. And because, if you think about it, with a few dodgy sound effects and a bit of music, you can pretty much convey all of Middle-earth to the listening public. Um, the main problem with radio was, how do you get this massive work, something like The Lord of the Rings, into a, a series which people would listen to? Um, well, they tried. The Fellowship of the Ring was dramatised into six parts, and it, was a, it came out as a Christmas treat from November to December of 1955. Um, but the rest of the story, they then actually bundled up into just a further six episodes. The whole of the two towers gets dished off in uh, three episodes and the return of the king in another three. And Tolkien was not too happy with this. Uh, in fact, he did comment that he didn't think the Lord of the Rings could ever be dramatised because it needed a lot of space. Now, those episodes have been lost, unfortunately, but the script does survive um, in the BBC archives and of the Fellowship of the Ring at least. And very interestingly, after each episode, there's a report that they went out and talked to readers and said, were we holding your attention? What didn't you understand? And so forth. And that may have led to the uh, truncation to the final three episodes for the next two books. Other dramatizations of The Hobbit followed on radio and so forth. But perhaps for many of us, for some of you in the audience, uh, the, the groundbreaking event was Brian Sibley and Michael Bakewell's 1981 version of The Lord of the Rings for the BBC which actually was 24 episodes. They then brought it into 12 episodes of one hour each. Uh, and indeed, as I've, I've written about, this probably was the, the single thing which got me into Tolkien to begin with. When it comes to film and television, the story uh, or to attempt to visualise Tolkien's works um, is worthy probably of a PhD dissertation in itself. Um, the first attempt to screen something by Tolkien uh, was in 1967. It was uh, of The Hobbit. It was made by one William Snyder, and it received one showing. One showing in a cinema. It wasn't because it wasn't any good, but they just had to show it to satisfy a legal contract that they then uh, claimed some rights over the book. And the problem with filming Tolkien, until we get to the digital world, is really the issue of scale. There's the landscape that he paints in Middle Earth. There are the cities. But if you think about it, there's the number of people in the battles which we have to deal with. The Battle of Pelennor Fields in Return of the King is estimated to have about 50,000 people in it. Um, and probably if you think about the great battles on film, we've got Dino de Laurentiis's, um, Laurentiis's Waterloo of 1970, which had about 20,000. Uh, it's true, Sergei Bondarchuk's War and Peace from 1966 had 100,000 extras, um, but he had the entire Red Army at his disposal, uh, and he only had to dress them as Napoleonic soldiers. He didn't have to dress some of them as orcs, trolls, or get some elephants in there. And then you also think about the scale of people. How do you film a troll standing next to a hobbit? The troll's easy. You just get a bloke in a giant rubber suit, but then if you've got a hobbit standing next to it and an elf and a man in between, you've got some real problems. So it's, it's understandable that the, really the only recourse was animation, either through something like Disney or uh, something like a Ray Harryhausen model, but that is extremely expensive. Nevertheless, quite a few companies were interested, including Disney, including the Beatles. I'm sure you've heard about this. The Beatles wanted to make a version of The Lord of the Rings with uh, Paul as Frodo. Um, and in 1969, Tolkien actually signed a contract with the United Artists, um, and it is one of the uh, most extraordinary contracts in film history. 
and because it said that the uh, filmmakers had the right to add to and subtract from the work or any part thereof, that they had uh, the right to make sequels to and new versions of adaptions of the work or any part thereof, to use any part or parts of the work or the theme thereof, any instance, characters, character names, scenes, sequences or characterizations therein. Basically, they could do whatever the hell they wanted to with anyone that appeared in any of the books in Middle-earth in perpetuity. And I'll come back to why that's quite important in the digital age. Um, Continuing with the film works, uh, there was a 1977 version of The Hobbit which came out on TV, but then the one that which probably you may have seen was Ralph Bakshi's 1978 um, film version of The Lord of the Rings. Now I've got a clip from it here, I hope. Um, Can't hear it, but that's not to worry. These are the orcs attacking uh, Helm's Deep, and it may, you can just see the sort of quality of uh, the film that we're, we're looking at here. It's pretty poor stuff, and it's using a technique called rotoscoping, where they filmed people walking along, and then some guy in an animation studio just drew over it. Uh, and clearly their budget didn't extend much to costumes, because some of the orcs obviously have the you know, horned, uh, horned helmets on, or they're wrapped in sheets with welding goggles or something like that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, Ralph Bakshi only got halfway through uh, and, and then stopped, so we don't actually have the second film to, to complete the story. Uh, and there were hopes raised when a, a 1980 a version of The Return of the King came out in animation, but this was so bad and so uh, confused unless you were taking some mind-bending drugs, you just had no idea what was going on, and it was probably the clue was in the fact that in variety it was billed as Frodo the Hobbit 2. Um, it was, of course, the advent of digital technologies that allowed us really to re- realise uh, Middle Earth and at the hands, capable at times at least, by Peter Jackson with his Lord of the Rings trilogy, which came out in 2001 to 2003. And the digital techniques provided answers to a lot of questions. We could do the scale. We could have hobbits standing next to dwarves, next to elves, next to men. We could do the scenery, Gondor, Moria, Helm's Deep, etc. They actually built models on a one-to-four scale of some of those scenes, which is quite extraordinary. And we had animations. We used CGI, particularly you're probably well aware that Gollum is actually Andy Serkis performing, and then they uh, overlaid that with um, some... uh, some digital technology so you could realise Gollum. And then finally, in the battle scenes, they actually created a a piece of software called Massive where they could individually code into an agent, an individual orc or whatever in the battle, um, some choices. So they could then run the programme and then the battle would happen and the orc could say, right, I'm going to run over that way. And they would collectively feed off each other. So you could replicate a battle with all these types of people. And... um, I'll just show you if I've got some clips from it here. Again, don't have the sound. Some, oh, dear. Oh, we do have sound. So you're getting a lot of live footage here, but you are getting... Now, I'd like to change track a bit and look at games very briefly, um, uh, because this is another way that, that Tolkien's world has been reimagined. And it may surprise you to know that there are about 140 board games based on Tolkien's works, starting with The Conquest of the Ring, which um, came out in 1970, which I've never played. Now, 140 does include Tolkien trumps and Monopoly sets, but the bulk of them are actually trying to do something with the the books themselves. Um, When you look at them, what they're trying to do, there are board games which are basically centred around the quest in The Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, where you have an individual, a character or a set of characters trying to go and do something. There are games set around one of the battles, the great battles, in um, Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. Um, And indeed, something which I'll talk about in a second, some of the uh, figure battle rule sets that came out in 1971 went on to something much more important. And then there are games which attempt to sort of combine both, where here, this is the War of the Ring, um, so you've got a map of Middle Earth and you, you move armies around and the bottom right hand are counters of armies um, but then on the left you've also got the, uh, the individual characters trying to move about so you're trying to sort of move massive armies around as well as get these individual hobbits and characters roaming around the biggest problem with these games is that someone has to play the role of Sauron um, that may sound odd but what I mean by that is in the book of course Sauron does not know 
that the objective is to destroy the ring. He thinks they're going to take the ring off and try and use it and, and, and blast it to bits. But as soon as you start playing this as a tower on you, you see these little pieces making a beeline over the mountains towards Mordor. You've got a fairly good idea that's the ring bearer. So you move all your armies that way and ignore the sort of little fracas going on in Gondor. And that's not something which you could, you could get over very easily. The other area which came out in games is role-playing games. Um, and these are quite interesting. And perhaps probably the best known of these is um, Dungeons and Dragons, which uh, emerged from Chainmail in 1971 and was first published in 1974 um, by uh, Gary Gygax and others. And I actually met Gary Gygax, and he had a discussion with him about the formation of this game, uh, which was extremely interesting. But throughout interviews with, with Gygax, he says, actually, no, the Lord of the Rings really wasn't that great an influence on um, his role-playing games. But, and you can kind of see that to a way, because when you play these games, you're larger-than-life figures, whereas in the Lord of the Rings, I think the figures are much more subtle, uh, the characters like Aragorn aren't really superheroes that go in and just blast away loads of people, and, apart from the films. But towards the end of his life, Gary Gygax did actually reply to an interview he, uh, on The Lord of the Rings and said, how did it influence the D&D game? Well, plenty, of course. Just about all the players were huge JRRT fans, and so they insisted that I put as much Tolkien influence material into the game as possible. Anyone reading this that recalls the original D&D game will know that there were Balrogs, Ents, and Hobbits in it, and indeed there were. And the same you could probably say for Games Workshop's Warhammer. And you can probably guess why. There are a lot of dungeons and adventures in Tolkien which really play into the idea of what these games were doing, where you often go down to some subterranean world to complete a quest. And once um, these had taken hold, it's only a matter of time before a set of rules came out that was devoted to Middle-earth. There you are, the Middle-earth role-playing game. You cannot believe the enjoyment I had of going into my attic and digging that out. <laughs> I relieved my youth. Um, let's now move to the digital world, computer games, um, and say a few words about that. Actually, the first computer game really, if you talk about, goes back to the 1970s with Advent or Adventure, um, which was kind of based on sort of interactive fiction, where you make choices and you move around. And from that came some mainframe computer games like Moria and Orthanc in 78, and, uh, both in 1978. And that is Moria. I have no idea. I never played this, but I, I, I'm guessing that is probably the original game. But the one, again, many people remember is The Hobbit, which came out in 1982 for the Spectrum. Um, it, there were two frustrating things about 1982. One was England getting knocked out of the World Cup, uh, Kevin Keegan missing a header. And the second was this game, because it ate up hours of your life. And you can possibly see why, because it was very text interactive. And you can see on the right, see Curious Map. I do not know the word C. Look, Curious <laughs> Map. And you just were struggling with all these sort of words to try and get the game to progress. Uh, this was followed by, in 1986, by The Fellowship of the Ring and then The Shadows of Mordor in 1987. Uh, and then finally, Electronic Arts released a CD-ROM-based set of games on The Lord of the Rings, which were basically role-playing. But interestingly enough, they had clips from the Ralph Bakshi film in there, albeit 12 years later. And like so many things, though, it all comes back to Jackson's films, 2001 to 2003, because once they came out, a rash of games came out uh, for the PS2 and the like. And this is where the contract comes in, because if you remember that contract that they signed in 1969, it basically said you can do whatever you want with any of the characters in this book, and you can write sequels and so forth. And that's really what led to this explosion of games following The Lord of the Rings and, of course, now The Hobbit. Um, interestingly, it also led to Lord of the Rings Online, a, a multi-user player game, where you, it's free to use, you go online, you set up a character, and basically you become part of this enormous world. Now, this cursory examination of reimaginations of Tolkien suggests to me something extraordinary is going on here. Because, of course, there are numerous dramatizations of Alice, of all kinds of writers, and so we can't really say that Tolkien's unique there. But what we might want to say is, why were the films so phenomenally successful? Um, partly, I think this is due to Peter Jackson. He does some things extremely well on the scale of the films. But also, presumably, there was a massive appetite for them. Outside of Bakshi, we had not seen a good film version, particularly a live film version, of one of the most popular books of the 20th century. 
And, and why are there so many games, though? Why are there 140 or 100 games, if you move away from the monopoly, about Tolkien? Um, so I would just like to finish by saying there's a few things here I'd suggest. First, Tolkien stories, of course, lend themselves very nicely to a game. They're a quest. You're about, you've got to go and do something. So there's an obvious objective and a way of winning. Second, I think Tolkien built a world describing in meticulous detail the flora, fauna, and history. And this is an absolute godsend to a games designer. You've got your rules there and then. Your maps, you can just put the hexagonals over. You've got your board. And you've got everything else about you might want to know about what it is to be a Rohirrim or, a, or an orc or whatever, and what things they eat and don't eat and so forth. And that is, I think, a testimony to the depth of Tolkien's vision. You can't, for example, imagine, at least I can't imagine, a fantasy role-playing game based on Narnia. And um, third, within these games, there, within these stories there, there might well be one. <laughs> Sorry, I should point out, but I, don't, I didn't play it if there was. Um, within these stories, there are easy sub-games. There's mini-quests, there's battles, things you can easily pick off. Uh, but then finally, I think there is something else which I just want to finish on, and that is what I believe are the enchantment of Tolkien's works, the secondary belief they conjure when you read, as he described it. And it allows you then to play a game set in his mythology which, in which you can immerse yourself <coughs> thoroughly in that world. We can all picture the landscape because we've read the books or seen the films, but mainly because he describes it so meticulously. And this, in this, I'm reminded of Tolkien's own comments in his essay on fairy stories. And he was talking there about something which he'd seen in folk tales called fairy and drama. It's a particular aspect of folk tales where the, the human protagonist somehow gets taken into the fairy world, into enchantment, and goes into this and is fully immersed. As he said, they can produce these fairy and dramas, a realism and immediacy beyond the compass of any human mechanism. As a result, the usual effect is to go beyond secondary belief you yourself are or think you are bodily inside its secondary world. And I think that's what's happening with some of these games. Fairy and drama for Tolkien was quite sinister. Think of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. But in the case of the games, it's obviously a lot more positive. So, to conclude, what next? Well, the desire to immerse yourself in Middle Earth knows no bounds. Um, this is what you would call live action role playing. I kid you not, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe, I can't quite remember, almost on a festival scale, not Glastonbury, but let's say truck fest scale, um, people assemble and dress up like that and beat the hell out of each other and uh, reenact Tolkien's battles. Um, so the desire there is, is, is quite uh, extraordinary. But I think the computers will probably provide that for us. Virtual reality is the next big thing one can imagine. And if we think of where computers are now compared with 1982, that Hobbit game, you can imagine where they'll be in 10 years' time um, through VR systems. So you will be able to go into Middle Earth, immerse yourself. Um, you can also see a mishmash, maybe, of film productions, which you're in part of. You can change the linear narrative of the film. You can be a person in the book. You can be an observer. You could change the story. You could have your own adventures. It's a bit like, I was beginning to think of Aldous Huxley's feelings when I was writing this passage. And I thought, well, that'll never happen. And then I read a, uh, an article this week, they're actually going to happen. They've developed the technology for cinemas to replicate feelings. So uh, many people have tried to guess what Tolkien himself would have made of all this. Um, I've no idea. I think all I can say is that the afterlife of his works is quite extraordinary. And I'll leave you with a quote <coughs> from 1971 um, from a letter from Tolkien, where he said, of course, the Lord of the Rings does not belong to me. It has been brought forth and now must go its appointed way in the world, though naturally I take a deep interest in its fortunes as a parent would of a child. <laughs>